Take a fancy carbon road race bike and batter it along some ancient cobblestone roads and you're going to need to make a few changes just to survive. Now, Paris-Roubaix is a brilliant date for bike nerds and racing fans alike. It's my favourite day of the year and in 2023 we were treated to an absolute smorgasbord of juicy new tech as well as plenty of tried and tested hacks. Some of it made its way to the pointy end of the race, while other innovations didn't fare so well. Here is the weirdest, the wackiest and the most wonderful tech from the men's and women's hell of the north, from self-inflating tyres to tubeless fails. The most notable tech innovation to actually appear in the 2023 edition of Paris-Roubaix was the Scope Atmos Hub which allows riders to increase or decrease their tyre pressure at the touch of a button. On the face of it, the tech makes sense for a race such as Paris-Roubaix. The race features 50 kilometres of rough, cobbled roads split into nearly 30 sectors. Riders use wide tyres and lower pressures for these sectors just to smooth out the ride. But the race starts with around 100 kilometers of paved roads and perfectly smooth tarmac separates each sector. Having a way to decrease your tire pressure for just the cobble sectors would allow a rider to save energy on the rough stuff, improving grip and comfort and potentially lowering rolling resistance in the process. The Atmos comprises a hub mounted unit on each wheel, tire pressure sensors, a proprietary valve stem and air liners, as well as handlebar mounted controls. The hub unit housing the electronics connects to the valve stem via two air lines to inflate and deflate a tubeless tire. The hub also communicates wirelessly to a unit attached to the stem connected to two handlebar mounted controls. That's one for each tire. The buttons on these controls allow the rider to inflate and deflate their tires by up to 0.5 bar or 7.3 PSI per second. So how did the Atmos hub fare in the race? Well of the two DSM riders using the Scope Atmos, Niels Akoff nearly made the break but ultimately fell short. His bike was fitted with the system and the mechanics have done a very neat job. Note the strips of bar tape under the control buttons to help fit them onto the flat top carbon bar. And then there's the counterweight opposite the valve to improve ride feel while heat shrinking the hoses to the spokes does keep things very neat. Akoff came home in 86th while his teammate Pavel Bittner, who was using the Scope Atmos, didn't actually finish the race. However, details of the system's effectiveness will have been fed back from the riders to the technical staff in the post-race debrief. Next year, therefore, we'll show whether the Scope Atmos is effective cobble-crushing tech or if it will be consigned to a one-off appearance at the 2023 race. And before we move on, three Jumbo Visma riders, that's Dylan Van Baal, Christophe Laporte and Eduardo Affini, were also using a similar system to the Scope Atmos. Theirs is called the Grava Caps. Mm. Laporte fared best but suffered a rear wheel puncture on the infamous Arenberg sector and never really saw the front of the race again, despite his 10th place finish. Ever since Matt Heyman won Paris-Roubaix on a Scott foil in 2016, aero bikes have dominated at Paris-Roubaix, and that proved again to be the case. While Peter Sagan was among the specialized sponsored riders on the Roubaix endurance bike, the disc brakes and wide tire clearances of the latest aero bikes means that there's just no need to swap from the usual race day machine. In the women's race, Alison Jackson danced into the Roubaix Velodrome aboard an aero-optimized Cannondale Super 6 Evo Lab 71. Her helmet was aero. Hell, even her sunnies were aero. A day later, Mathieu van der Poel won the fastest ever men's edition aboard a Canyon Aero CFR. He wore a skin suit from Callus, an Abus Game Changer aero helmet, and covered a good portion of his shins in Zwift branded aero socks. Even in a race over the stones, aero rules. The Roubaix in particular looks positively retro in a pro race in 2023, with all of those exposed cables at the front of the bike. It's a bit of a myth that Paris-Roubaix is a pan-flat race. The race climbs more than Ghent-Wevelgem, 
but the nature of the dragging climbs means that some special chain rings are in order. Riders tend to fit a rather large outer ring for this rapid race. In the case of Shimano's riders, the now standard 54 tooth chain ring fits the bill for most, though we did see some 56s. But SRAM riders often swap out their 52 tooth outer rings for 54 tooth dinner plates. But it's at the inner ring, if you're using a 2x setup, where a rider will make a big change. Gone are the standard 38, 39 and 40 tooth chain rings and in come some sizable 44 and 46 tooth monsters. Quite simply, a small inner chain ring just isn't needed for the rolling portions of the course. And should you require an inner ring after a crash, for example, then you're likely going to be stuck in it until the end of the cobbled sector. Now, shifting a front derailleur on cobbles is a risky business. So the larger inner ring size is there to simply get you to a point where you can actually shift back to the big ring. After Trek Segafredo's Lizzie Dignan powered away to win the inaugural edition of the women's race in 2021, one by drivetrains have been growing ever more popular. 2023 saw nearly every SRAM rider using a single chain ring up front, with only a smattering of riders still opting for two chain rings. Mads Pedersen and Wout van Aert both opted for 54 tooth chain rings, while Mariana Voss opted for a 50 tooth chain ring to see her over the cobbles. While there is a simplicity aspect to using a one by setup, you do introduce a risk of unshipping the chain. To protect against this, every rider that we saw using one by was also running some sort of retention device. From what we saw, no Shimano or Campagnolo riders used a one by setup. In the lead up to my favourite weekend in the cycling season, we had a dig into the archives and found Lars Boom's Roubaix bike from 2012. The cyclocrosser was ahead of his time using Giant's TCX cross bike to run 30mm tyres for smoother passage over those stones. While tyre sizes have been increasing over the last few years, we've never seen so many 30 and 32mm tyres with a number of riders also using inserts to add kind of run-flat protection, including Wout van Aert, Mariana Voss, Mads Pedersen and John Dagenkob. Add in the trend for growing internal rim widths, and there was some very, very wide rubber on display for the hell of the north. Pfeiffer Georgie was a case in point. The DSM rider used tubeless Vittoria Corsa Pro tyres in a size 32mm. We can't quite make out the exact pressure, but the mechanic working on her teammate's bike is definitely using that thumper pump, thumper pumper, to put them in the region of about three bar. That's around 44 PSI. In the men's race, we know that Matteo Trentin of Team UAE has about 3.4 bar in his tires. 30 millimeter tires were a bit more common. DSM, Movistar, Ceratiz at UEE and several other teams in both races squeezed the biggest tyres that they could into their frames. But what of it? Winners Jackson and Van der Poel both rolled in on 28mm tyres. Now speaking of new tyres, a new tyre from Specialized actually broke cover first in the women's race on Saturday. SD Works, Bora, Quickstep and Co were all rolling on what looks like a new Mondo tyre. This all black tubeless ready tyre gets specialised top end S Works name. We're yet to hear anything official regarding the new tyres but they're clearly close to being production ready given the decals printed on the sidewall. Those decals give us some key information on the construction. Now the Mondo uses the Gripton compound with its latest T2 and T5 combination. This sees the central kind of slick section made from what is claimed to be a fast rolling T2 compound. The shoulders of the tyre are slightly textured and made from a T5 compound which, Specialized says, is grippier in the corners. Crucially, one thing missing from the sidewall info was any form of puncture protection. Now Specialized usually specs its road race tyres with black belt puncture protection, but we can't see it here. An interesting choice, I'd say, for a race famous for its punctures. Now, while we're talking unreleased tyres, the Vittoria Corsa Pro was a popular option among teams sponsored by the Italian brand. The Corsa Pro broke cover last year and has been used throughout the early season races 
so its presence at Paris Roubaix was hardly a surprise. An official launch must surely be around the corner. Now, you may have noticed a theme with all this tyre chat. Yep, that's right, it's time for one of our favourite subjects, and it's tubeless. Continuing a trend that's grown quickly over the past couple of years, tubeless tyres were by far the most popular in both the men's and the women's races. Van der Poel had one of the most casual bike changes we've ever seen, but finished with no other issues on his tubeless Vittoria Corsa Pro setup. That's a good day for Matthew van der Poel. Jackson bucked the trend though and won on what we believe is a set of tubular Vittoria Corsa G2.0 tyres. Indeed, as we're about to see, tubeless tyres aren't always without their issues. Now, unfortunately, we saw the usual share of nasty Paris-Roubaix crashes. Some were caused by mud patches, others by the usual elbows out Roubaix racing, and one or two featured some tubeless failures, including a huge crash in the Arenberg forest for poor old Fred Wright. We're unsure of the cause of these crashes, but to see tubeless tyres, many of which appeared to be fitted with inserts, fail and then dismount from the rim in this manner, certainly does raise a few eyebrows. After two broken bars in the space of just one race a few weeks ago, you could forgive Hugo Hofstetter and his Arkea teammates for switching back to a traditional alloy stem and bar on their Bianchi Ultra bikes. Forgiven but not forgotten, chaps, it looks ugly as sin. But Hugo wasn't alone. Numerous riders opted to leave their integrated carbon bar designs in the service course and start on components that they have a bit more confidence in should they have a crash. Not that the fear of carbon got to everyone. Van der Poel stuck to his Aerodes cockpit, Ineos all used Pinarello's most front ends, DSM were happy with Scott's designs, and Mads Pedersen, he went as far as using his latest Madone aero bike. Now, if you are worried about the jaunty frame shape on the Madone seat tube being fragile, then the fact that it survived Paris-Roubaix will go some way to dispelling those doubts. With many riders opting for the tops of the bars when riding on the cobbles, satellite shifters are needed so that they can, well, still change gear. Some, such as Trek Segafredo's Mads Pedersen, had them neatly glued to the underside of his integrated carbon bar. Lucinda Brand, meanwhile, preferred to have hers mounted on the rear face of a round Bontrager bar. Achieving such a choice required a fair amount of electrical tape, I think you'll agree. Niels Pollitt had his attached to the cable covers of his S-Works Aerofly 2 bar via what we assume is adhesive putty. Garner, meanwhile, had them poking through the bar tape facing forward. Voss had her SRAM blips down in the drops, while this SRAM-sponsored human-powered health rider ditched her SRAM blips in favour of a DI2 satellite shifter. You can always rely on Peter Sagan to rock a mechanical drivetrain at Paris-Roubaix, and the Team Total Mechanics duly dug out an 11-speed Dura-Ace disc brake group set to stick on his Roubaix. While electronic shifting was feared to be delicate when it first came to the Pro Peloton, some riders simply prefer the, well, mechanical feel of a cable-operated shift. On the rough cobblestones, having a slightly larger lever to hang on to can't be a bad thing either. Unfortunately, the former world champion and Roubaix winner crashed out of his final cobbled classic. Narrow roads and numerous small groups mean that your team car can be several minutes adrift at Paris-Roubaix. Should, or might I say when, you have a puncture, getting the wheel off yourself before a mechanic arrives will get you back into the race without a long wait. Teams either left small levers fitted to the ends of the through axles, or if that wasn't aero enough, they simply strapped an Allen key to the seat post. Let's just hope that they fitted the correct size. Rough cobbles mean that you risk losing anything that isn't bolted to the bike. Even then, riders often take to Twitter to ask for computers back after the unit escapes or the bolt on mounts jettison themselves. The simple fix for most things is skateboard style grip tape. Bottle cages? Grip tape then. Computer mounts? How about some grip tape? Got a future shock control girl? Get me that grip tape. 
for all the new tech on display at this year's Paris-Roubaix. Sometimes you just can't beat good old-fashioned hacks that have stood the test of time. Finally, while grip tape and a roll of electrical tape can solve a lot of your problems, for everything else, there's always a Sharpie. Set Van Mark of Maxis-sponsored Israel Premier Tech opted for a set of Continental's GP5000 tubeless tyres with the branding rather obviously scribbled out. You'll have to try harder than that to fool us, Seb. So with all of that wrapped up, what do you make of these new tubeless inflation devices? And do you even trust tubeless tyres now that we've seen some of those crashes? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Now, if you liked this video, remember to give it a like. Check out a similar video just here. Remember to subscribe and we will see you next time.